And I got to start uh, learning about you guys and what you're doing here. And I've been excited to hear how you're changing lives and doing ministry on this part of 249 uh, and this part of town. So thank you guys so much for what you do. In fact, you have ministered to me before. So every once in a while as pastors, we get some time off. And one of those days that I had time off, I decided I'm going to go visit the brook and do worship with you guys. So one Sunday, I got to sneak in here incognito. I didn't know anybody. Nobody knew me. I wasn't responsible for anything. And I just got to come and worship. And the worship team and the people here blessed my life, the message. So thank you for giving me a Sunday where I just needed to be blessed. And you guys blessed me and didn't even know it. So thank you for the ministry uh, that you do here. I love uh, being in ministry. I've uh, done ministry for 35 years. Uh, and I've been at my current church for 15 years. And so I enjoy that so much. The other thing I love about this church is I love, I don't know if y'all call it your mission statement, vision statement. I don't know what you guys call it. But I love these words. We are real people finding real hope in the real world. I love that. That tells me, this is what it tells me when I read that, that I get to show up just as I am. That I don't have to show up. I get to be a real person. I don't have to put on a facade, fake it, act like I'm anything that I'm not. And I love that you guys are saying, we want to be real people. We want to get to know each other. We want to be authentic. We want to do life together. I love that you say, finding real hope. Man, the world tells us that we're going to step out and find hope in a lot of things. But when I hear that you guys say that you want to find real hope, I know that means you're finding real hope in Jesus Christ and what he offers and what he can do and the healing and the life that he can bring each one of us. That's what I read when I see that. And then living in a real world. Guys, we live in the real world. And I love that you're not saying that we're going to put on rose-colored glasses and look at the world for anything that, it, that, you know, that it's not. It's hard out there. People need real people like you with real hope speaking into their lives. And so I love your mission statement. So I just encourage you to keep living into that, keep being those people, keep making the difference that you are right here. So John told you my wife and I uh, have been married for 32 years. We have uh, uh, two sons and a daughter. My youngest son, this is uh, his wedding this past June. And I have a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law. And I love my family. God has been so good to bless me. Uh, with, with this family for a long time. And I, I love this picture, and I've loved my family for a, for a long, long time. But God did something else in the past few years that took love in my heart a little bit more. Um, it's sort of like the Grinch when he said that his heart grew bigger. He gave me grandkids. Any grandparents out there, I think if you are, you know what I'm talking about. They come along, and this dude right here, my little dude, this is Braxton. He's four and a half, and I love hanging out with him and spending time with him. And yes, this picture, that's his personality. He is all in life and loves it. And then we've got Malachi, who is five months old. Look at that. Look at that cutie. Yes. And he, man, and every time, you know, it's like every time we've got another person added to our family, my heart just goes bigger, bigger, bigger. And what I've loved about what God has done for me in bringing these beautiful children and this family into my life is even more and more, God is showing me what the love of God is like. I just, I don't need anything from them. I just like to be with them. There's a song out right now, Hillsong Song. Uh, Hillsong has a song, and it's called uh, Good Grace. And there's a line in it that has become my favorite lyric in any Christian song right now, and it says, God is madly in love with you. We'll say that again. God is madly in love with you. The God of creation, let that sink in. The God of creation, the God who made the world, worlds, the God who spun it all together, the God who knit you together, who knows you better than anyone else, who knows the good, the bad, and the ugly, is madly in love with you this morning. And nothing we can do can change that. And he loves everyone. So if you don't hear anything else that I say this morning, you may, I don't know what you brought in here, what you are carrying, but I know this, God is madly in love with you. And he is delighted 
that you showed up to worship him in this place this morning. And those of you who are at home, he's delighted that you've joined as well. And so now the sermon's over. No, I've got a few more things I want to say. But he's madly in love with you. So several years ago, when I was a younger youth minister, uh, we had our three kids. They were younger. And God was providing enough for us to have our needs. Uh, we were living fine. Uh, we could do the things we needed to do. But we didn't always have the money to do the extra things. So one Wednesday night, there was a man at our church that came up to me and he handed me an envelope on Wednesday night after youth. And he says, take this home and open up this envelope when you get home with you and your wife. Now, that's one of the hardest things for me to do when anybody gives me anything. I'm one of those people that even at Christmas, like when I was a kid, I would go and I'd open up the ends of the, the packages to see what was in there. I didn't like, I wanted to know what's coming my way, but I waited. And I got home, and when I got home, I opened up this envelope, and in it, there were two round-trip tickets to anywhere in the United States that Southwest Airlines flew to. I was like, man, that's awesome. And then there was a check, and it said spending money. And there was spending money on that check, and we opened up the card, and it said, Andy and Cheryl, thank you so much for what you do for our kids and the, ma- the amount of time you put in with the youth ministry, and we just want to bless you. Use this however you see fit. So we had money for spending money and airline tickets, and we were like, where are we going to go? So we decided to go to San Francisco. Uh, we flew in there. We had money to do, so we did, you know, Golden Gate Bridge and Alcatraz and the trolleys and all that stuff. We ate at restaurants that we usually don't get to eat at because we had the money to eat there, you know, and it was, like, fancy, and we loved it. We went to a show, and then we drove out. We rented a car and drove out to a Napa Valley. We spent a day going to wineries and having picnics. That's, I mean, it was just awesome. And I was so blessed by the generosity of someone else. Then the next week when we got back and we saw that couple at church, they asked us about the trip. And I really believe they were just as excited to hear about how much fun we had on the trip as we were for taking it. You could tell that they were blessed that their generosity had made such a difference in our lives. So to this day, I am thankful for that little getaway that my wife and I got to have. And it started me thinking about, as Johnny gave me this passage to look at this morning, I started thinking about what would it look like in our lives to start living as people of radical generosity? I mean, that gift to me felt pretty radical. I was like, this, who does this? But I I got to be blessed by that. And so I want to go into Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and look at the passage you guys have been looking at the past few weeks. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came over every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing those proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So there's this really cool thing going on in Acts, that first church that we're reading about here in Acts chapter 2. But today we're going to be looking at the verse, verse 45. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing their proceeds to all as they had need. You see, there was an amazing koinonia fellowship going on in the early church. They had an intimate joint partnership, which John Owen talked about a few weeks ago. And this intimate joint partnership led to these people having a generosity that was radical, They were in such partnership and fellowship that they were willing to sell their possessions and what they had to make sure that nobody did without, that nobody was left hungry or thirsty or without clothes. You see, what they were giving to and what they were selling their possessions for weren't for people to have have the things they wanted. These were needs, daily needs to survive. And in the early churches, we started thinking about what they had to do was they were starting to say, we're going to live differently and radically so these people can be taken care of. 
Many of them had been Jewish. They'd been grown up in Israel and the Jewish nation and the Jewish religion. And what they did at that time, that if somebody was poor and in need, the tithes and the offerings would be taken to people and they'd be given so they could make, make do. They could have the needs that they had. Now, these people were, were leaving Judaism. They were leave, leaving the religion that they'd already always had. And what, who was going to take care of them? What was going to happen? And the church said there wasn't a wick. There wasn't food stamps. There wasn't a safety net. The church realized that as they were changing their lives and following Christ, that it was on the church. They were going to be the first line of defense against hunger, against thirst, against nakedness. And it was up to them. And the beauty of it is that they were coming off the teachings of Jesus that were saying, this is who we need to be. Just that, man, that short time of Jesus teaching and his death, and now they're living it. They knew they had to step into this in a beautiful way and live the way that Jesus had called them to live. And so this morning, what I want us to do is look at some teaching, a teaching that Jesus gave on what it means to give and live that kind of life. So if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25 or on your iPhones, or it's going to be up here on the screen. And I want us just to take a few minutes to look at what it means and what Jesus was calling us to do. Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick. And you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? Then the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes. You did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. You see here at the ending of his, his, his uh, ministry here on earth, Jesus was telling them, you need to see and have eyes for the people around you. Jesus wanted them to know that it was so important to him that one way that we would be judged for the way that we lived here on earth was how we did life, how we saw. Were we aware? Did we see what was going on? Or were we living in our own cocoon, not really watching out for what's going on? And in our world today, man, I look around our communities. I look around our neighborhoods. I look in my neighborhood. I look in my church. And yes, we do have people that need food, that need water, that need clothing. But I even start looking at this passage even more and start thinking, what is Jesus trying to tell us when he brings in those that are, that are the stranger, that are sick, that are in prison, I think what he's saying is, I, I, I don't only need you to be generous with your resources. I need you to be generous with your life, with your soul, with all that you have. So this morning, we're just going to take a few minutes to look at the three ways that I think Jesus is telling us to look at this passage and how to do life so that we can have hearts of generous, generosity, so we can step into that. 
So the first way that I want us to look at is this. The first right off the bat, we've got to be honest. He does say your treasure. We've got to be generous with our treasure. He says we need to feed the hungry. We need to give water to the thirsty. We need to clothe those, clothe those in need. To do this kind of thing takes money. And the early church knew that, and they knew that if money was tight, that that meant the call of Jesus in their life was going to be to sell what you have, your possessions, your things, and give that money to somebody else. No, no, man, we all work hard, don't we? And we work hard for the money that we have. And the thought, sometimes for me, is that I, I kind of want, you know, and this message is as much for me as it is for you guys. This is what I struggle with. Uh, what I make is, is I feel like I work hard for it and I want to keep it because I want to have those things that I need. But many times what happens is it's not only the things that I need. I work for the things that I want. And one of my struggles is I like things. And the other struggle I don't want you to know this morning is sometimes I like the things you have. I see what you have, and I'm like, man, I want that. Because I want a new car, and I want a new big screen TV, because my 75-inch big screen TV isn't big enough, so I need a bigger one. And I want, you know, I'd love to have a, a vacation home, and I love to go out to eat, and I love to go on vacations, and I love to, and I things and things, and I don't know what the things are that you love, but I do have things that I really want. And I know that we work hard, and part of that is we get I think we get, to on, we get to have things and we get to buy things and we get to have a life that we've been given. But sometimes I'm afraid that I live in a way that, that I, I start stockpiling and I start getting so much that it gets in the way of me being able to be generous because I'm thinking about the things that I want. I mean, I just can't, I can't it blows me away how many of the self-storage places we're getting. Because we don't have enough stuff, enough room in our houses for our stuff anymore. So I've got to go get a room somewhere else to put more stuff in it. And then those get full. I had a guy the other day tell me that his storage room is so full he can't remember where he put something that he needs. So it's like almost building the bigger barns kind of a thing. But I do that. And then all of a sudden that gets in the way of me being able to be generous. And I start stockpiling the things that I want and forgetting about the things that I need. And I think part of the thing that struggles, that I struggle with with giving as well, and you may too, is that do I really trust that God will take care of me if I give it away? I think sometimes I'm afraid that there will be lack or at the end of the month if I give stuff away that I won't have enough money to make it. And so I think we're called to trust that God will take care of us. But then I get there and I'm like, but will he really? Will he really take care of me? Or do I need to make sure that I'm in control of taking care of myself? Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, I love the way the Holy Spirit works this morning. Aaron quoted it. But in Matthew 6, it says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Because he says, Jesus is going to, God will take care of the birds of the air. And he clothes, I mean, he, he, he clothes the, the flowers. He gives them something to wear. But yet, I think many times we spend time worrying, can I make it if I am generous? Will he really, will God really do what he says he will do? And that takes a step of faith. I look at, you know, I, I start thinking about Jesus and I think the reason he can call us to a sacrificial life and sacrificial giving is he sacrificed it all. He understood that he was calling us to be people of sacrifice, to say, can I give this up in the name of Jesus Christ to make the difference in somebody else's life? And the truth of the matter is, yes, it is sacrifice. To give, but it is a holy sacrifice that brings us closer to Jesus and actually makes us start looking more like Jesus every day when we sacrifice in that way. And John was talking about it in our gifts. Man, your gifts right now are going, the gifts that you give to this church, these gifts go to helping feed the poor, 
and doing ministry and keeping this church alive and making a place where people can come and find Jesus. We, we can't talk about giving if we don't talk about the way that we give back out of what God's given us in a, in a, in a joyous way of saying, Jesus, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you've given. When I was a youth minister, we would take uh, kids to Mexico and to Haiti, and we would do mission trips. And our kids were, were exposed to things that they'd never seen, especially when I was in West Texas. And man, in West Texas, our church was a pretty wealthy church. And, and, and I, you know, I, I like what you have sometimes. I'm gonna, I mean, I do, I envy sometimes. And I work, Jesus and I are working on that. But there were kids at this church when they would turn 16, and they would get a brand new truck or a brand new car. And, you know, sometimes they'd have that, the Ford Raptor. Like, I'm envious. Like, I want a Ford Raptor one of these days. And they'd have brand new cars, and I'd be looking at mine. I'd be like, God, I know you called me to ministry, but Lord, Jesus, please. But they'd have all these things. And then we'd go to Mexico, and we'd be out and we'd be building the buildings. And, and they'd get to go out, and they'd get to visit the homes. And when we were in Haiti, we walked the streets of Haiti, and you'd just see poverty that you've never seen before in your life. And when we'd get back together at night, and we'd start talking about the day, our kids were always blown away, and our adults were always blown away because they said, these people are so happy. Like if you'd go up to their door and you'd knock on their door or whatever, they may have a dirt floor. It may be a shack. They may be sweeping the dirt in front of their house to make it look better. But if you went to their house, they would always, almost every time, offer you a candy or a cookie or a drink. They were offering out of having very little, but they were so generous. If you came to their home, they were going to give you something. They were being generous out of lack. And these kids were saying, man, I don't know that I'd give away, and I've got everything. You see, generosity came from a heart that said, if you come to my home and you're a stranger, I will give you something. And that blew them away. One of the times we were there, we took over, we had a, a group of about 136 teens and adults there. And the ladies of the church came together and they made a thousand homemade tamales. Because they believed that as Americans, which we do, we eat too much. And they thought that everybody there needed 10 tamales. We didn't need 10 tamales, but we ate all the tamales. But in generosity, they made a thousand handmade, hardworking thousand tamales. Because they wanted us to know they were thankful for what we've done. So this morning, I just ask you, how is God inviting you to be generous with your treasures, to be like that first century church? And then the second one is, and this one may be even harder for us, to be generous with our time. Anymore, it used to be if you ask somebody, how are you doing? They'd say, I'm fine, I'm okay, I'm doing good. Anymore, it seems like the answer to how are you doing, I'm busy. Oh, I'm busy. And we're busy taking kids to dance and to uh, sports and we're busy going here and we're going there and we, we fill up our calendars with all kinds of things that we've got to do. Uh, we work harder. We work more hours. And so time is valuable and we just so many times just don't have the time anymore because we're busy chasing everything else. And I'm as guilty and I'll say it myself. But when I start looking at this and Jesus saying, I want you to be generous with your time, what I, what I read in this passage was that if I'm gonna go sit with the sick, if I'm gonna go to a prison, and if I'm gonna welcome in the stranger, and I would even say today, folks, if I'm gonna minister to the lonely, and that's gonna take time. When I go visit the sick, I've gotta have enough time to sit with them and listen to them and see what I can do. If I am going to visit someone who's in prison, I need to sit, and it can't be quick. It can't be a quick five minutes in and out. If I'm gonna get to know the stranger and love the stranger and love the lonely, then I've gotta give enough time to sit and hear what's going on and find out who they are. Church, how many times do we miss the lonely and the stranger? Because I don't even have enough time to see them. In this day, man, I think in the past two years, when you read uh, articles, the amount of depression, the amount of loneliness, the amount of hurt, the amount of brokenness in our world since 
social distancing and all the stuff that's been going on, that's not going to be healed and taken care of, especially for those that don't know Jesus, by us giving a little flyer and saying, hope you do better. It's going to take time. And am I willing to invest my time into making somebody else's life better? This week, <laughs> the Lord hit me with this smack in my face. There's a guy that I do a small group Zoom with on Thursday mornings. And he said that his mother-in-law, who's living with him, has COVID, and he was going to get a test at 10. I found out later that day that he had tested positive as well. So he's positive COVID, two boys living at home, wife, mother-in-law's in the hospital. They're all sick. And the first thing I started thinking of is, man, I don't have, I need to do something for this guy, but I don't have enough time uh, to do something for him. So I bet I could get Uber Eats or I could, you know, I could call somebody and just have them go deliver some food to their door and that'll take care of them. And then all of a sudden I started thinking, I'm talking about this sermon. I thought, ugh. Even when I'm talking about this service, my first inclination is, let me do the thing that takes the least amount of time, but lets him know that I care about him. So I didn't do that. I called and I said, hey, what would you like? And he goes, I said, this, this, or this. And he goes, man, we really love Popeye's chicken. I was like, Popeye's chicken it is. So yesterday I ran by Popeye's chicken, got a family bundle, took it to his house. He opened the door. I kind of did the, you know, <laughs> here you go, and I backed off. But he and I, he was over there and I was over here, but we got to talk and I got to find out what's going on. And I wouldn't have had that if I wouldn't have taken the time when my soul was saying I don't have enough time, but if I wouldn't have taken time to sit there and say, I'm gonna go by and see him face to face. Who in your world right now needs you to stop long enough and say, I'm gonna see you face to face. I'm gonna sit with you. What do you need? I'm gonna love you enough to do this. So I think radical generosity means I'm gonna give up some of my time and realize that it may be better served doing ministry. And then the last one, and I'll hit this pretty quickly, is what is your talent? Or can you be generous with your talent? To have a church like this running, to do ministry, to do the things that we need to do, we need everybody jumping in and saying, you know what? I'm gonna be generous with my talent. I'm gonna give back to the Lord. It takes a talent to go visit someone in prison. Maybe that's not your talent. I think it takes a certain kind of personality that can go and sit with the sick. Every one of us, I think, has a talent to at least say, good morning, hello. But so many of us have talents that will help the church be what it needs to be and to do ministry so that other people can have time to, do their, to use their treasures and their time and then our talent. And we all come together and we start doing this work and we start serving together. I believe that one of my talents is hospitality. I love people. I love hanging out with people. This past Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, uh, one of the guys at our church came up to me and he said, man, he goes, I want you to know this is, a, this is an anniversary for me at this church. He goes, several years ago, I visited your church on the Sunday before Easter and then we had Good Friday service and it was the first time he was there, single dude, moved to our town, didn't go to church and after Easter, I mean, after Good Friday, that Friday night, I saw him sitting by himself. I went and talked to him and I said, hey, we're going to Gringo's. Do you want to go eat dinner with us? And he was like, yeah, I'd love to go eat dinner with you. And I invited him, we had dinner, and then he came to church Easter Sunday. And he said, Andy, that invitation made me realize this is the church I wanted to go to. And then he said, and what's really cool is, I started going to the young adults ministry, and you know my story, because you introduced us, but I met my wife there. And now we've got a kid, and now we've got our family here. And he goes, it was the one invitation that let me know. He goes, maybe I'm overstating, but he goes, that invitation made me know this was a church for me and my life was forever changed. It was a talent that I have for that. My wife's talent is taking pictures. And last night we had a fundraising for our youth group uh, get together where they're doing some work with the youth group. And her pictures were all over that room of pictures she had taken for that. My mom, she's 89 years old. She can't do a lot. Her talent, her gift, is she has the list of our youth group kids and every youth group kid every year gets a birthday card from my mom. And at Senior Sunday, they all talk about, I love my birthday cards from my mama Suge. That's what we call her. 
That's her talent. But it's all of us coming together using our treasures, and some can use their treasures. Their gift is giving. Some is their time. Their, their gift is ministry. Some is talents or other things, but we're all coming together to use our talents to make a difference for our church. And it's this radical thought, as everything I have is yours, Jesus, I'm willing to give it. And so as we finish our sermon this morning, this time together, I want you to read something that that really impacted me. And again, I knew I was doing this this lesson, and it was a, uh, I get a weekly prayer that I get to read, and this prayer came up, and I was like, Lord, thank you for just giving this to me. And it's a gift, it's it's a prayer that Henry Nouwen penned many years ago. But I think this quote speaks to why we would be generous. Dear Lord, Help me keep my eyes on you. You are the incarnation of divine love. You are the expression of God's infinite compassion. You are the visible manifestation of the Father's holiness. You are beauty, goodness, gentleness, forgiveness, and mercy. In you, all can be found. Outside of you, nothing can be found. Why should I look elsewhere or go elsewhere? You have the words of eternal life. You are food and drink. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the light that shines in the darkness, the lamp on the lampstand. You, you are the house on the hilltop. You are the perfect icon of God. In and through you I can see and find my way to the heavenly Father. O holy one, beautiful one, glorious one, be my Lord, my Savior, my Redeemer, my Guide, my Consoler, my Comforter, my Hope, my Joy, and my Peace. To you, I want to give all that I am. Let me be generous, not stingy or hesitant. Let me give you all, all I have, think, do, and feel. It is yours, O Lord. Please accept it and make it fully your own. Amen. Church, isn't that awesome? Come on. Isn't that awesome? I love that. To you, I want to give all that I am. Let me be generous, not stingy or hesitant. Let me give you all. All, all I have, think, and do, and feel. It is yours, O Lord. Please accept it and make it fully your own. I think when we see what Jesus has done in our lives and what he's given us, what he has sacrificed, I believe that's what propels us to be people of generosity. And then I think that kind of koinonia fellowship, that kind of living will be what the world sees. And I think that, not what we say, but I think by what we do, I think that's when the world will look at us and say, okay, I want to get me some of that. That's what I want to be a part of. So that's what propels us. That's what calls us. The sacrifice and generosity of Jesus Christ compels us to be people of radical generosity. Pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this time that we get to gather and look at some of the awesome teachings of your son, Jesus. Father, thank you for him showing us how to live, how to be, how to do this thing called life. And when we're, when we're tempted to want to hold on tightly to our time and our talents and our treasures, when we want to hold on tightly, Father, help us in faith let go of that, knowing that you will provide all that we need. You are the sustainer and you are our God. Father, thank you for the witness of that early church that even when they ran out of money, they'd sell what they had to make sure that nobody went without. Father God, help us be those kind of people because ultimately we want to look just a little more like your son every day. And it is in your son's name that we pray. Amen.